endurance has been found at a depth of 3,000 meters. And there's even better news than that, because not only has it been found, she looks amazing. In what's been called a milestone of polar history. And let's get more on this for you with historian Dan Snow. I was watching archaeologist Manson Bound and his sub three team working around the clock for a month in some of the most hideous conditions of planet Earth. It was minus 35 degrees of wind chill. They were working through the night. It was brutal working conditions. I was stunned. Absolutely stunned. The wreck is in incredible condition. Uh, there's virtually nothing living on it at all. Uh, you can still see the original paint on the vessel. It's as if it sank only yesterday. As I speak, we have the submersible down there conducting a 3D LIDAR survey of the whole area, including the debris field. And with that, we'll be able to construct 3D uh, models of the wreck, which are millimeter perfect, if you like. Hello, explorers. I'm so glad there's a big group today because we have the ultimate guest, the captain of the S.A. Agalas 2. Oh, oh, good. good. Uh, we're joining us from Harrington Middle School in Montreal, New Jersey. Hey, Seabots, how you doing today? Good. Great to see you. Hey. Hey. Today, we've had a laser scanner down, we've had 4K cameras down, and we have confirmed that it is the wreck of insurance. It matters because it will connect people around the world with this amazing story of heroism and survival. But even more than that, it will give people around the world a sense of wonder, at exploration and adventure, and the things that we're going to do, unlocking the world with our technology. Welcome to the stage, your host, Joe Cooper, with Medicine Bound. Full house. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Who goes first? Well, I'm, I'd just like to say how exciting it is for me today because um, I'm one of the team of bird curators up the road at the museum, and this having Menton here today in Tring talking about the endurance is really exciting because it's little known how great an archive of Antarctic history we have just up the road, including specimens from Shackleton's last expedition on the quest, which I've been looking at a bit. And also uh, front of house, we have one of the first emperor penguins uh, ever discovered on public display. So it's really special to be here talking to you. Isn't show me the emperor penguin. Uh, no, another, <laughs> another time. We, we had an hour at the back. museum together. It was absolutely great. But I've come away with kind of hay fever. You, you walk into the, the storage rooms there and you get hit by this wall of smells, right? It, the, the, the smell of Yeah, and it's had this sort of biochemical outdoors. reaction with my head. So if I sniff a bit, you know, that's all it is. But it, anyway. But it's lovely because we have this archive, but we don't often get to explore the expeditions uh, like this, and especially not the endurance in Shackleton. I mean, we've just seen the video. Yeah. Is it still feeling fresh? How, how? Oh, uh, you mean the whole adventure? The, the, the kind of that, that, the, the discovery. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Without spoiling it, uh, the end of the book, they, they um, find it. How? How? Yeah, how does it like? feel now? Well, we're, we're uh, what are we marching? <laughs> Eight months on, and uh, in some respects, it feels like yesterday. <laughs> in others, it feels like an age ago. But yeah, it was uh, a brilliant moment. You know, it was the I suppose you could say the pinnacle of my career. I always kind of felt that my life was kind of narrowing to that 
sounds arrogant, doesn't it? So narrowing to that moment. But, you know, I'd always kind of lived with Shackleton, I have, all my life. And it felt kind of right when at last we found it. I mean, this is, an in, this is a really interesting thing, is to kind of go right back to the beginning yeah. and where you started with, with all of this. Yeah, and, yeah, I, I should have explored. I'm, I'm, I'm from the Falkland Islands originally. And um, Shackleton really I, I goes right back to childhood. My father was a very big on Shackleton. Everybody in the Falklands is big on Shackleton. Scott never went to the Falklands. Shackleton was there three times. So, you know, I was weaned on stories of Shackleton. And uh, when I was, I don't know, 11 years old, something like that, 1959, 1960, it would have been, I was given a book, a boy's book about Shackleton as a, as for, as a Sunday school prize for, for attendance of all things. And I read it, it was great. And then we had this kind of tangential connection with a uh, family link with Shackleton because when he was in the Falklands, uh, he and uh, the captain of the endurance, a man called Worsley, and the second officer, a man called Tom Cream, uh, they lived at a, a sort of a pub come bedding establishment that was run by my great, great, great grandfather on the waterfront in Port Stanley. It was called the first and last. And we still have the visitor's book in the family. It's got all their signatures in it. So, you know, I, I couldn't escape Shackleton when I grew up. I mean, Shackleton's um, a really interesting figure because you've known about him for your life. And I came across him probably in my early teens when I was starting to get interested in sailing. But the recent interest in Shackleton is, is, is it, I don't know if people are aware of this, really dates back only about 20 years or so. And he's yeah. kind of really been captured in the modern era. What is it about Shackleton that... Yeah, he, he kind of comes and goes in waves, doesn't he? Yeah, it? people kind of... It, was, uh, it gets reinvented. There, there was that book, uh, Endurance by Lansing, was published in yeah. 1959. That was one of the turning points. And the funny thing is, I read that book when I was about my mid-teens. My mother used to have a, a bookshop in Port Stanley, can you believe it? Population 1,000, a bookshop. I know your wife has a bookshop as well, Ben, but, you know, you're bigger than, yeah, 1,000 people. I mean, nobody ever explained to her about business plans or anything. But uh, I do remember, you know, we, we sold uh, the endurance book, you know, by the box load, because all the FIDs, all the people going yeah, to the Port yeah. dependencies, Shackle, you know, down south, all passed through Port Stanley, and that was the big seller. And it was huge, and then there was a wave of interest, and it kind of died away after yeah. that again. And, it, and then it came back about when... About, um, about 1998, yeah. that I'm aware of, and then since then, it's just gained and gained, and hence the, yeah. the, the response to... You can't yeah, escape it now, can you? No. My, my wife and I had um, some neighbours over the other, the other night, and there were two policemen there, and they'd studied Shackleton as part of their detective's exams, all to do with leadership. I mean, Shackleton was, was, was a very um, uh, complicated... No, not complicated. He was... Um, I think that's fair. Yeah, he was layered, shall we say, yeah, very. character. He... Uh, he didn't really reveal very much about himself. I've got to say that. I mean, if you think of all the great national figures in recent British history have kind of become baked into our DNA, mm. we probably know less about Shackleton, what made him tick, than probably any of them. I mean, think of, I don't know, think of Nelson, think about Churchill, think about, I don't know, the Beatles. I mean, we, we, we know so much about all those people, but about Shackleton... Nothing. He reveals so little. Even in his diaries, his diaries, all the diarists on the endurance expedition, he was easily the worst. He, he just he tells you, I, it's, it's like, I often wonder about diarists, whether they're really out to reveal or to conceal. I think Shapton was out to conceal. I mean, he, he never lets you into his head, ever. Frustrating guy. But, you know, do I like him? Yes, I do. But not because of... Um, the reasons he would probably have me like him. I mean, I don't, all this stuff about, you know, the hard man of the snows, <laughs> no, that doesn't move me one inch. I, I like him for his flaws because he was this sort of, I don't know, sort of bag of contradictions. On the one hand, he was incredibly practical. You know, he, he was, uh, you know, he, he was very well organized, despite what everybody says, he not being organized. He really was, at least on the endurance expedition. But then on the other hand, he was this really, fleecy-headed romantic who quite literally dreamed of buried treasure. I mean, you know, most of us boys have these kind of 
delusional fantasies, but you know, we grow out of them. Shackleton didn't. You know, he was, he was uh, very cautious. You know, they called him Cautious Jack, but on the other hand, he was very unrudded, very impetuous, very, I, I don't know, torrential as well. Uh, he, was, he was very, how should I put, generous. He was kind. He was yeah. great, good to the men under him. Yet he could be very, you know, moody, very grumpy, very mean-spirited at a time. He never forgot or forgave an injury. He was that kind of a man. But on the other hand, he was incredibly brave. He yeah. was very determined. You know, you cannot take those qualities away from him at no. all. No. So, and, and the other side of this is mm. then the maritime archaeology and oh. what led you into kind of wrecks, because that's a whole other area of fascination. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that goes back to the Falklands again. Uh, I grew up, or oh, I spent all my holidays on this tiny little island called New Island, which is the westernmost island in the entire archipelago. There's nothing but open ocean between New Island and Cape Horn. And there was a very sort of lonely existence. I was, myself and my cousins were the only boys on the island. But, you know, if you're on a small island off the Falklands, you had to have working schooners or catchers. And so I spent a lot of my youth on small working boats. And I always found them very, very scary because very often I was the only sober person on board. You know, there I am, eight, nine, ten years old. You have three or four adults as crew and you could depend on it by six o'clock in the afternoon. They were all paralytically drunk in the, skip, in the scuppers. And, you know, I'm sort of, you know, just a boy bringing this boat back to New Island. It was terrifying stuff. But then uh, I lived in Port Stanley. And Port Stanley, uh, back then, uh, without any exaggeration, was the finest outdoor museum of 19th century nautical antiquity Ooh. in the world. Oh. Uh, I mean, all those ships were trying to get around Cape Horn in the face yeah. of the implacable westerlies. And you've got to remember that everything around Cape Horn is coming at you from west to east. And these ships would struggle forever, so battling to windward, you know, just to try and find that slant that would allow them to escape from the, from the uh, uh, Atlantic into the, into the Pacific. And that was what broke down men and ships. And they'd turn before the wind and limp for the Falkland Islands, the downwind companions of Cape Horn. And very often they were then condemned as unseaworthy and there they would stay. So, you know, as a boy, myself and my father was always, we were always clambering over these wrecks together. He was fascinated by them. The SS Great Britain, that was in the Falkland. You know, oh. The ship in, in Bristol, which was so fabulous, that yeah, came yeah, from yeah. the Falkland Islands when I was a kid. I used, to, I used to clamber all over her. My father used to say we were looking for duck eggs. Duck eggs. I don't know why, because we never ever found any, but you know, so it goes. So, I, oh, in archaeology, half yeah. the question. I mean, yeah. that's the thing, because I'm involved in some excavation projects, but the difference is that, you know, this, the cave site I'm working on, people have been in there for 100,000 years, but a wreck is a whole different time. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I started off in land, like you, okay. terrestrial sites. And I, I just, scraping dirt, just did my head in. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're chasing shadows half the time, and, and then you have these incredible academic discussions about shadows and the dirt, you know, is that a post hole? We all stand around and scratch our heads and then we decide it's a post hole and the question comes, well, you know, does, does it relate to that shadow in the dirt over there? Oh, there's one over there. Are they all, and nobody knows, you know, it's that kind of frustration you get, you know, you find a, you know, a body shirt and, you know, and you're supposed to get all excited about it and I'm looking at it and I think, oh, it's a broken pottery, it doesn't have any decoration on it, you know, and we can't date it because it's just a, a functional bit of utilitarian kitchen where, you know, but with a shipwreck, you know, usually you got a date and it, it's that old um, cliche, you know, uh, time capsule type thing, you know, everything in that ship is, is was pitched onto the seabed uh, in, in an instant. And there it's remained. And because water is such a, a brilliant preservative in the right circumstances, it's all there usually. Whereas, you know, the story we get on land, I'm not putting down new land, well, uh, archaeologists at all, but, you know, it's such not, a defective record. I'm taken. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the Mary, I started off, my big break came with the Mary Rose. Um, um, you were, were you involved with that? No, but I, as a, I watched that coming out um, as a, a, you know, my school assembly, and I saw 
the I ship mean. under the tents being sprayed, and I went back recently to see it, and it was absolutely extraordinary. You know, I missed that. And the reason is, it was exactly 40 years ago, I worked on the Mary Rose, mm. but I missed the raising of it because I was, um, I was, it, was my, it was the year of my very first excavation that I directed. Oh, and okay. um, it actually goes back to Mary Rose. It's kind of an interesting story, totally true, totally, uh, what's that word when things happen to you unplanned? Um, Cynthia. Yeah, serendipity. Thank you, sir. <laughs> serendipity. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, uh, I was, um, the, the Mary Rose was, was found by a man called Alexander McKee. And um, uh, I and my wonderful wife, who's here somewhere in the audience, we were students together at Oxford. The year would have been 1980, something like that. And uh, I was, uh, I met the man who found the Mary Rose, Alexander McKee, right? He was a writer. Uh, he lived on Hailing Island. And my wife, Joe and I were down there visiting him. And we're in his studio, and his, his little writer's studio is completely book lined on all walls, except for the very top shelf. And around the top shelf, he had like this array of little bits and pieces that he'd found on the seabed during his long life as a diver. And I said to him, Alex, you know, where did that piece up there come from? And he, uh, he stopped and he said, you know, Minson, of, of all the pieces up there, why did you pick out that piece? And I told him, I said, well, you know, I can tell from the shape of it that it is Etruscan. I can date it to about 600 BC, give or take, you know, 20, 25 years, something like that. I know it's come from, you know, the seabed because it's covered in marine deposits. You know, if that piece came from a shipwreck and that shipwreck still survives, then that would be an archaeological site of outstanding, potentially outstanding archaeological significance. And he told me that Indeed, it did come from a shipwreck 20 years before, 1961. He'd been working on this island called Giglio off the coast of Tuscany. And I went, to, I went to meet the man who had the dive school, lived in London. He showed me these photographs of just people, snapshots of people holding up pottery. And in that moment, I realized that I blundered into something of really outstanding importance. Wow. And four years, my wife and I excavated that shipwreck. And today, if you want to see the stuff from the Giglio ship, the Underwater Archaeological Museum of Italy, the top floor is completely full of stuff from the Giglio ship. And that's really where it all began for me, because at the end of that excavation, and you'll appreciate this probably more than most, I wasn't even 30 years old, and yet I had this huge exhibition in, in, in Florence at the National Archaeological Museum. I was still a student, you know. And uh, it all just went from there, and there's been shipwrecks ever since for 32 consecutive years. I never wow. stopped excavating, evaluating, surveying shipwrecks, and eventually along came the endurance. Well, this is, this is a really interesting, because you, to kind of, the endurance is a wreck without a, a tragedy. So many wrecks are like the Mary Rose. Um, there's great loss of life associated with them. So does it change the flavor of the search, knowing that the endurance was a success story, although she's a wreck. Um, yeah, I, I mean, all wrecks are, are, are different. Um, but of course, the thing about the endurance was that she was just so completely intact and perfect. Mm. I mean, yes, everything above main deck level was broken down, uh, demolished. But everything below the main deck was, and we'll look at that later, mm. uh, was in absolute perfect condition. Um, it was just, um, and the fact that there were no bodies on board made it really nice too, because I have wreck. Yeah, well, the Mary Rose, a lot of bodies yeah. on that wreck, and I've yeah. worked on others. There's one wreck in the, uh, where was it? Um, oh, the River Plate. 500 people died, and there were just bones everywhere. First time I went on that wreck, there was a leg bone in the anchor, and I pulled it up, and. Uh, sometimes bodies, uh, on the Mary Rose, it didn't bother us at all. I mean, I think for most archaeologists, dead is dead. Uh, I, did, I don't remember it sort of disturbing us very much on, on the Mary Rose, but it did disturb me greatly in some of the other wrecks. I do remember finding uh, in the River Plate this, this clutch of bodies, and it was obviously a husband and wife and a little girl, and they're all together like that. And... It was the ship's surgeon. Mm. And how do I know that? Because his medical instruments are with him. 
and he was still sort of pretty much semi-addressed, his boots were all there, and he was half absorbed into an iron concretion. And I think on, on that occasion, we said, okay, stop. This is, this is as far as we go. Yeah. And we stopped at that moment. So at that moment, I really felt we were intruding. But yeah. But the endurance, I, I mean, was just, uh, you know, was, I, I made some predictions back in when we first announced the project at the Royal Geographical Society. And I said the likelihood was that she went down keel first, um, that she would be proud of the seabed rather than absorbed into it. And I said she'd be upright. And I said that she'd be in a really excellent state of preservation, which wasn't hard to really say because there's the yeah. absence. <coughs> Those uh, albatrosses. <laughs> you've got it now. Yeah. Because uh, of the absence of wood consuming marine parasites in the Weddell Sea. But yeah. I mean, the endurance is, has always struck me as particularly elegant looking ship. She, she seems to be quite different from other polar ships. Yeah, she was. She was uh, conceived as, as, as a yacht, but not, not quite as a yacht as everybody's thinking, but as, uh, how would I put it? Okay, so the beginnings of the, the endurance, she was actually conceived by a man called Adrien de Guerlache, who is these days better remembered from having led the Belgica expedition down the west side of the, into the Bellenhausen Sea on the west side of Antarctica. Uh, and when he got back after that expedition, he decided that it'd be a really cool thing to do, to take tourists to the Arctic, to shoot polar bears. <laughs> Can you believe it? You know, to the wow. Edwardian times, I mean, <coughs> it's the beginning of the yeah. tourist industry, the poles, wow. I guess. Anyway, so he went into, he went into business with a man called Christensen, and together they designed uh, the Endurance, or the Polaris, as they called it after the North Star, with the intention of taking, it couldn't have been many, because there's only 10 cabins on the Endurance, so it could only be a maximum of, I don't know, 10, 12 tours, something like that, to take them up to the North Pole. But by the time they launched the Endurance in 1913, he was in financial difficulty and uh, they had to put the ship up for sale. So, you know, the, the timing was absolutely exquisite. Along came Shackleton and they couldn't sell the ship because although she was sort of, if you look at her, she's got those very sleek lines, yeah. that raking bow, a high counter stern. She was beautiful to look at. Actually, she handled like a slug, but she was really nice to look at. Um, but they couldn't sell her because you know, she, she wasn't really that luxurious as a ship. Mm -hmm. They couldn't sell her to some well-heeled uh, Edwardian businessman because, you know, steam yachts then were all much better appointed. Nor could they sell it for, let's say, the sealing trade or the whaling trade because she didn't have any, any, any capacity for the storage of oil. So she sort of really was, was a bit of a white elephant. But then along came Shackleton. And they sold it to him, I think some, some sources say 10,000 pounds, others say 12,000 pounds, but it was a knockdown price. He got it as a gift. So he was pleased. But that's the story of the background of the endurance. Yeah, and that explains those, the lines, is yeah. that she was going to be easy on the eye, if not on the helm. She was very easy on the eye, yeah. She had those sort of uh, eye sweet curves to her. Yeah, and she had a sail plan, which is quite interesting. She was a, a brigantine. That is to say, she had square sail on the foremast and fore and aft sail on the main and mizzen, which is quite an efficient way of, of, uh, of sailing a ship like that because uh, they only had a crew of eight on board. So you had to be able to manage that sail. So you couldn't have her over canvassed at all. And also they had a roller system on the topsail sail. Topsail is sort of the one between the topgallant and the mainsail. And usually by that time, the topsails were in two parts, two courses, but they had it in one, one course and they had it on a roller so they could manage it from the deck. So in fact, she was quite an efficient ship to manage in terms of crew numbers. That's really interesting. And when you, I mean, I was reading the book, really interested from a kind of natural history museum point of view is that the trigger for the kind of the conversation that sparked the idea was actually based on a natural history museum um, oh. uh, exhibition, yeah. 
And there seems to have been a bit of a light bulb moment somewhere in South Kensington. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I can't attribute that to me. I mean, I have heard it said and seen it written that this whole thing was my idea. It was absolutely categorically not my idea. It was the idea of a friend of mine. And you're right, it began with an exhibition uh, at your museum. There was a lady there, I forget her first name, her surname was Sim, S-I-M-M. -M. Um, she contacted me one time uh, to see if I could find the Terra Nova, which of course, as everybody knows, was um, Scott's ship, the, the ship he took on his voyage of no return. Uh, and the year was 2012, which was the centenary of his death. And your museum was putting on a sort of a retrospective mm. of his life and his achievements. Anyway, she contacted me um, on behalf of the committee to see if I could find uh, the Terra Nova. And I met at the museum and I said, yes, I could absolutely find it. I, I was sure of it because I had a really good set of coordinates for her. And I said, give me a week in the right kit and I will find the Terra Nova for you. And I think your idea at the museum was to make that the focal point of the exhibition. So I'm meeting up with this friend of mine, a man who's absolutely passionate about the sea and everything to do with sea, from ocean science to wrecks to everything. And um, we were meeting in, in, in uh, Cafe Nero <laughs> on the old Brompton Road, the original Cafe Nero, the very first in the chain, and, and it was just around the corner from where my wife and I have offices. And we were there the day it opened, along with Francis Bacon, the artist. But that's another story. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I'm meeting my friend there, and he was holding the table, and um, I went over to get the coffees. And while I was waiting for them to, par to, to pour the coffees, I was leafing through that day's complimentary newspapers. And there on page seven, it was unbelievable. There was an article and the headline ran, Terra Nova found. <laughs> I was just oh, uh, utterly devastated. I was just completely demolished. I, I said to somebody not so long ago, it was like that, that scene in, in Rocky Three, And you probably don't ro watch the Rocky movies, right? No, no. Quite right. But anyway, it, it, it's this fabulous fight scene there in, in round 11. And yeah, you're still not with me, are you? Okay. Uh, Rocky's fighting this guy called Clubber, Clubber Lang, and, and he delivers this perfect punch to his solar plexus, which lifts him right off the canvas. And it was like me at that moment. I was completely shattered. And my friend said to me afterwards, I, I was just ashen-faced. He said, what's wrong? So I showed him the article, and he, he goes, well, you know, what about the endurance? And that was the moment of inception. That's where it all began. So it wasn't my idea, it was his idea, and I wasn't even close to it. And the grand irony of it all is, I tried to talk him out of it. You know, I said, no, you know, it's under the, the perennial ice, the, the, you know, the, 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 the notorious pack of the Weddell Sea. You know, it's, it's deep, deep down, and the technology is not ready for this one. And he's the kind of guy that when he gets a challenge in his teeth, he just, he doesn't let go, thank God. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he went off and he compiled this amazing fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles and all the team it takes to manage them. Because if you're going to run high end deep water technology like that, you've got to have pilots, you've got to have engineers, you've got to have software engineers, you've got to have data analysts and hydro, you know, and, and, and operations are so expensive, you cannot afford to stop the 24 hour a day operations, which means you've got to have two teams of everything. And anyway, it took him for quite a while to put all this together. And then eventually he and his wife and myself and my wife, we, we met at a restaurant in the Cotswolds. And at the end of the din dinner, he said to me, the time is here, the time is right to go for the endurance. And he tasked me with finding the endurance and a very, very close special friend of mine uh, called John Kingsford, who is CEO of this great company called DOS, um, Deep Ocean Search which collaborates very close, closely with Ocean, uh, with Ocean Infinity. 
And John and I worked together for a long time. I went in, I disappeared into the archives, read all the diaries that were unpublished, all the, all the documentation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Spry, the Falklands, National Archives, British Library, went through them all. And, and John was, um, John Kingsford was, was trying to find the right icebreaker and all the hardware and stuff like that. And went, then we formed a committee. And here I've got to pause and give you some names you know, because if I don't, uh, <laughs> now we found the endurance. If I don't mention the names, people get, you know, sensitive naturally enough. But, um, you know, there's John Kingsford. Uh, uh, and then there was a guy, uh, an amazing guy called um, Donald Lamont, who's now chairman of the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust, which oversaw mm. the recent search for the, uh, for the endurance. He was a former governor of the Falkland Islands, a very, very successful governor. Um, and he later became ambassador to, uh, to Venezuela. He was in Caracas, he was in Montevideo. He was an old Cold War warrior who was based in Moscow and you know, in Berlin when the World War came down, all that kind of stuff. And he just bestrides this whole project. That's told. But then we had a, a guy called George Horsington with us who was in charge of ship management, all that kind of stuff. And then George left us for a job in Switzerland, and his position was taken by John Shears, who became the team leader for both 2019 and this year. Mm. And then within the team, we had uh, a lady called um, Holly Hewitt, who is the Ocean Infinity representative on board, who is hugely important, and she took care of everything practical. Back Deck was run by an amazing woman called Claire Samuel, uh, the guy in charge of underwater operations was um, from the US Navy Top Gun School of AUV pilots, a, a guy called Channing Thomas, an absolute genius. And then you move into this year, and we had an old friend of mine from you know, lots of missions, a guy called JC Kailan, who was running the back deck. And then an absolute genius, an underwater engineer called Nico Vincent, who ran all subsea activities, both below water and above. And he was the one who I believe I'm confident saved the project. It was a decision he made, which enabled us to find the wreck. Oh. Okay, so where are we at? <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, just describing putting together the expeditions is, is I mean, there was a massive, you, you had two goes, there's 2019 and there's 2022. And there's a step change between the, the technology yeah. and the approach between those two expeditions. Yeah. Um, so, level, yeah. yeah, it was hugely different. What was the thing on the 22 expedition that made the most difference in terms um, of the technology? A lot of things. Uh, there was a technology, right? Conceptually as well. Uh, I, was, I was, in 2019, I can't speak for the others, but I was very uh, hubris, is what I'm trying to explain. There was a large element of that with me. I, I thought we could sort of pummel the ice into doing mm. you know, what we wanted kind of thing. In the end, it was the ice which pummeled us. And when we left the pack, we were completely beaten. I was you know, dangling by a severed nerve and I'd been completely horse whipped and oh, it was a terrible moment. Uh, you know, I went back to the head office in London and uh, you know, I was just dreading reporting to the head office. You know, in detail about what had happened. And they're wonderful. You know, I, I went in there thinking they were going to hand me a pistol with one bullet in the spout and send me off to the library to do the honorable thing or something like that. Nothing of the kind. They, the, the guy turned to me and he said, Medson, don't worry, we're not giving up. Wow. And so we went back in. But, you know, there was an attitude change, certainly. I, I for one, thought that, you know, I, I could impose, we could impose our will on the ice in 2019. And then, I don't think there's anything we discussed so much, but certainly this year we allowed the ice to impose its will on us. And that was a very important change. And then there was the technology, which you mentioned. We used AUVs in 2019. These are, they look like torpedoes to look at. And they really are remarkable uh, items for, for deep ocean survey and searching, but probably not the best tool for under the ice. 
you know, we, we have a, a range of, of uh, sonar, a remote sensing payload systems within them, within the vehicle. And at the end of the, the voyage, at the end of its mission, we bring it back on board. We download the data. The data goes to the server, which, which uh, changes into a kind of a, um, a legible format that the data and the analysts can then handle. Um, it was great, but we lost that vehicle in 2019. I had drawn up a, a search box and we covered half the search box. But then it was easily the worst moment um, of the entire mission, of the probably my entire life as a marine archaeologist. It just disappeared. I say the vehicles are autonomous and they are. When we release them, we have no further contact with them. But every six or eight hours, they were configured to, we, we program them so that we can meet up with them and have what we call a handshake. It's like a rendezvous. Yeah. They go into holding position, like, like planes circling an airport. And then we sort of interrogate their various payload systems. And then we issue them with fresh navigational instructions. And then we release them into silent running. And then we don't sort of, no further contact until the next handshake. And it didn't turn up for one of those handshakes. And it was just awful. And we spent two to three days just charging about in the pack, just trying to make contact with them because they do have a beacon and they are emitting a signal. And if we go over them, we can pick up that signal. But it was really dangerous conditions that we were into. Winter was upon us. The ice was muscling up around us. The pressure was building. It was like the coils of a boa constrictor around us. And then this, what the captain called, Captain Knowledge Bengo called, a monster flow just moved in. And we just, we couldn't fight that flow. It was five meters thick. It was all gnarled multi-year ice. It was as tough as teak. And at that point, Captain Bengo had a meeting on the bridge. I, we were there uh, with, with the ice pilot. They went off to one side of the bridge and I knew what they were talking about. I think we all do. And then they came over and they delivered their verdict. And it was that we get out of there fast and we turned around and we hightailed it out. And it wasn't a moment too soon because I think if we'd stayed any longer, the ship would have been in danger. Um, so then we come to next year. So one of the lessons we learned was, we learned a lot of lessons from 2019. In fact, you could say that it was what we learned in 2019 that paved the way for the success we had yeah. this year. Without those uh, mistakes that we made three years before, I'm not so sure we would have had the success we had this year. But the a key part was that we changed the deep ocean technology to a system called Sabretooths, which have only been on the market for really a couple of years. And, and that's what those kind of sled yeah, like that we uh, saw on the video before. Yeah, yeah. that's right. We saw them in, yeah. the, in the film being launched. They're a bit like huge iPhones, aren't they? Sort of flat and yeah. But the difference is that they are tethered to the surface. That means that we are in constant contact with them. We know where they are three dimensionally. So if we lose one of the vehicles, as we did in 2019, we know exactly where it is. And then we could deploy the second vehicle to rescue the first. So it was a whole sea change in terms of technology. But also, we're getting the data in the moment. Uh, we see the data coming in. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's coming in. Everything we do is acoustic, pretty much, underwater. But we see the sonar data just sort of coming down. It's like a cascade across our, yeah. our screens. And we can actually watch for anomalies or what we sometimes call points of interest on the screen. So yeah, very different it was this year. So we are, we could talk about this for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I've got to sort of, I'm going to point this out because somebody's very kindly brought this up to share with us. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to have to bring a kind of, because we're going to have to give everybody else a chance to ask questions, but I've got one more question That's my to class. ask. Just do a check. Yeah, just in case. I <laughs> rare diseases or something I don't know about. Just, just a little note to the online audience to start getting your questions in as well. But start to um, give your questions audience here as well. So somebody's very gen generously brought this in to share with us. Thank you. And yeah. this is a hoosh pot that was on the expedition. Um, so using this as an inspiration, what 
one thing would you want to kind of spot on the, the cameras and the rec Ooh. surveys and go, that, that's there? Um, sorry, I missed the last part of the what, what, what's the, we've got one thing here from the expedition. Yeah. What one thing did you kind of most want to see popping up on the cameras apart from the immaculate, uh, beautiful endurance? Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just totally overwhelmed by this. I mean, Jeff came up to me. I'd never, we never met before, right? I, I mean, he showed, we were standing together, weren't we? Yeah. Just there off stage, and he, he just showed it to me. Just casually. Yeah, casually. And he said to me, this is, this is from Hussey, it has got tent number, number one on it. And I said to him, Hussey wasn't in tent number one, remember? And, and then he further explained that actually it didn't belong to Hussey. Uh, how did the story go? It, it, it was James's. Uh, and sure enough, James was in tent number one, Reginald James, the, the expedition physicist. And, uh, you know, I know the, 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 the descendants of the James family in, in South Africa. <laughs> I wonder if they know you got this. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's got, it's just unbelievable. Sorry, it just sends shivers up my spine. Thank you so much for showing it to us. But anyway, the, your question. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this reminds me, you know, when we found the endurance, there was crockery everywhere. And some of it was, Jesus, aluminium? Some of it yeah. was metallic, just like that. And in the diaries, they talk about the metalware they had on board, because they started off with a lot of ceramic where when they left England and bit by bit on the voyage out was all broken. So when they got the river plate, they started buying metal wares, you know, so they were enameled wares and things like that. And sure enough, you know, one of the, the real surprises was that the, the main deck, the actual pantry had been bulldozed away. The wardroom had gone, although you could see the footings of the walls. You could see exactly, exactly where it was. But all around was all this, this metal ware like this. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, how that, you know, how do you explain it? Why is it all there? There's a couple of scenarios. Maybe as she was sinking, you know, all these pots and drinking things were all sort of raining down like, you know, like playing cards or like leaves in the wind or something like that. So when she was deposed on the seabed, all these things landed on top of her. Or maybe she struck the seabed with such a force that, these things were stacked in the, in the pantry area and they just sort of, you know, the reaction was such that they were just bounced up and then came down around the main deck. It was really strange. So I think, I mean, that's a great answer to yeah. the kind of artifact question. I just want to give that another little pat there. Yeah. Um, what are we... So we're ready for questions. Uh, as soon as you've got a question, put your hand up. I've got, I'll, I'm going to kick us off with uh, uh, the first online question. Jacqueline mm -hmm. Fraser has asked, I would like to ask Menson, is he could describe the difference between, differences between Shackleton's diaries and South, <clears throat> which was ghost written. Do the diaries show the real Shackleton and are the diaries are ever likely to be published? Yeah. A lot of questions wrapped up in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. South was ghost written by a professional journalist in New Zealand. I think I find it a good book. It really does stand up to, to, to literary scrutiny. But, you know, you know it, it's Shackleton burnishing his image. And he was very, you know, Shackleton was, was playing the fame game all along. I mean, all celebrities do this. They're, careful about what they release and you know they're, they're curating their own story and Shackleton was certainly doing that. I think it would have been a better book if they had if he had used more from the diaries. I think when they wrote it they had yellow um, old Lisa's diaries was there I can see that and I can see Worsley's diaries there. Uh, he was not consulting with Wordy's diaries which is a great pity uh, nor did he make any use of, well, James's diaries, which is another really good diary, uh, or even indeed Chipping McNish's diaries, which is what? It's a bit terse, let's say. But, you know, the, 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 the real Shackleton story is not in South, it's, it's in the diaries. And a lot of them haven't been published because of, you know, the family still own copyright and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, is, is it truthful? It is fairly truthful. It's, it's very hard to trip Shackleton up, but he's very selective 
about what goes in and what doesn't. Good. Audience, where are you? Questions. Here we are. Have you got the microphones going? Yeah, I have. Oh, yeah. Hi, over here. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting and really insightful, and thank you very much. But I was just wondering, um, in about 1914, when um, Winston Churchill said to Shackleton, proceed, do you really think with what you know about Shackleton now and, the, and, and in the context of everything that was going on at that point, that the expedition, expedition wouldn't have gone ahead if... Churchill hadn't said proceed, or do you think, having read about Shackleton, knowing what you do about him, he might have circumnavigated and pardon the pun around that and uh, yeah. gone ahead anyway? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just kind of. It's I an know interesting really question. Know. It takes Thank us you into very the much. Character of Shackleton, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so the story is the Endurance left the Thames on the 1st of August. 3rd of August, it was off Ramsgate. War was declared. And Shackleton sent a telegram uh, to the Admiralty. And at that time, the man who was in charge of the Admiralty, at least on the governmental side, was none other than Mr. Winston Churchill. Um, he quite literally had his trigger on what was the greatest, biggest, most devastating weapon the world had ever known, which was the British Navy. So Shackleton sent off this telegram offering his services and the ships to the nation. And uh, Churchill fired back apparently within the hour with one word, proceed. Hmm. Yeah, maybe he didn't like Shackleton very much. That was the truth of it. <laughs> and you can see why, because there was a lot of Shackleton running around in Churchill and a lot of Churchill running around in Shackleton. You know, they were both vain, vain glorious, a bit arrogant. But at the same time, they had the good side as well. But yeah, Churchill never quite understood, you know, so what was it he called them? You know, a bunch of penguins down south, I think he referred to Shackleton as. Um, so I don't know is, is the real answer. But there were people on board who had strong reservations about going off at the moment when their country was in great need. I mentioned Ord Lees a few moments ago. He was, uh, he was a colonel in the Marines, and in his diary, he ruminated upon this very matter. He wondered how he'd be received when he came home afterwards. Would his friends look at him, especially within the military, as somebody who disappeared you know, at the moment of crisis? Well, as it happened, they all came back in 1916. There was still a lot of war left, mm -hmm. and indeed, some of them played the, the ultimate price. One man, Timothy McCarthy, he died at his gun in the Western Approaches. Uh, who was it? Oh, it was Cheatham, who died when his ship was torpedoed in the North Sea, as I recall. Um, there was one other. There was the further navigational officer. He died. No, he died in World War II in convoys. So two of them died in action. Two of them were severely wounded. Wilde's brother, who was with the Ross Sea side of the Shackleton expedition, he died in the Mediterranean in action. So, you know, they all did play their part. You know, I mean, Worsley, he went on to ram a submarine for which he was, he was uh, awarded. He did very well. He had a good war. <laughs> yeah. We've got one question in the middle there. Yeah. There's, there's another interesting local link to this, which is that the film of the expedition uh, was restored at the National Film and Television Archive, which is just outside Berkhamsted, a few miles away from here. And I think it was around about the late 90s, which may be the link as to when the renewed interest that you mentioned earlier. One of the interesting things from that film is you see the endurance being crushed by the ice pack with the masts falling, and it looks like it's being crushed quite significantly, quite severely. So I was intrigued that the condition that you found it in was actually quite good. So is it sort of a partial um, yeah. survival, or, or is it actually in better condition than you're expecting? Do we have uh, any of those still illustrations at all? We could, I, uh, Mr. Slide projection. It was just the video we had, yeah. Just the video, we don't have any, no. any photos. Okay, yeah. So, uh, right. Uh, the, the ship was in, you, everything above main deck level was bulldozed by the ice. 
The ship was down at the bow and heeling to starboard, and the ice came over the starboard side and just shoved everything across the main deck. So the wardroom, the pantry, the galley were obliterated, as were a lot of the cabins on the accommodation level of the main deck, beneath, let's say, beneath the poop. They're gone. But the rest of the ship was just incredible. I could not believe it when I saw it. I mean, you could see the paintwork on the timbers. You could count the fastenings on those timbers. And when we did the archaeological dive, our first dive was to, to get all the 3D uh, laser scan data. Once we had that in the can, then we went in for our, our archaeological dive, which was actually to examine uh, the wreck through cameras in real time. And that was just, oh my God, it was just mind blowing. We approached the wreck from the stern. At the very first thing I saw, I did not expect to see. It was the ship's rudder and it was laying under the tuck of the stern. And if you, if you know the story, it was when the rudder was ripped off by the ice and all the water started to penetrate the hull. That is when everything went. To, yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> upside down, yeah. Um, uh, uh, but I, I, th I always imagined that the ice would have carried away the, the rudder. But to see it just, just sitting there like that so innocently was just incredible. And then we, we came upwards over the stern. <coughs> and then we saw the ship's name and it was arced like that over the Polaris star. Thank God Shackleton left the original Polaris star there. But the word endurance like that and that massive anemone over the A-N of endurance. It was just, oh, and then it gets better. We went up over the taffrail and then we're looking down into the well deck and there was the ship's wheel, absolutely intact. And we'd always joked in the team about finding our wreck and you know, finding the ship's wheel with the captain still lashed to the helm and things <laughs> like that. Crazy stuff we talk about in the ship. And there was the wheel, just perfect. You know, the kingpin on the spoke, you could see it. And there in front of the wheel was, was the steering mechanism. And there abaft the wheel was the companionway. The doors were open of the companionway, which took you down to the accommodation level. And there in the companionway, you could see these pigeonholes, you know, where the ship's flags were, which they'd used to run up the gaff. It was just incredible. And then it only gets better. There are two portholes there. What were they? You know, they're the portholes to Shackleton's cabin. You know, and you, and you, in that moment, your head is just, you know, just totally, totally intoxicated. You know, the thought of, oh my God, Shackleton's cabin. What is there in the cabin? Well, I knew for a start that between those two portholes, there was on the wall in sort of a big, heavy wooden frame, which was sort of screwed on top and bottom, was Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. Wow. And that was still, would still be there in, in totally legible state. And, you know, we know this, you know, uh, newspapers, letters and things from the Titanic, they were still legible. Uh, and, you know, it was ugh, the thought of, you know, Kipling's poem, If, still there. And all, you know, Shackleton's little bits and pieces and books and stuff like that, still there in that cabin. And then we moved down the deck and there are two holes, the main hole and the fore hole through which the cargo passed on the way into the tween decks. And they are both open. And, you know, you could see down. I, I, you know, we couldn't stop. And there's so much pain as well as joy. I just wanted to say, stop, guys. Let's upend the saber tooth. Let's fire it lights down into the hole and just look around. But we couldn't do that because we're running out of battery and time. We had to keep moving. So we passed over these two. Uh, these two holes, and you could see the steps going down into the darkness. And then, and then there was this moment when there were uh, four or five of us in the control room at that time. Uh, there was myself, there was a guy on the sticks piloting the vehicle, because we're just literally inches above the deck, and it's really dangerous piloting, because you've got all those masts were down and ropes were everywhere and stuff. And he said to me afterwards, it's the most dangerous piloting job he'd ever done. And we're picking our way through, and then suddenly there's three holes in the deck, and there's a data analyst and a hydrographer, an old guy on a camera. And it's just us in there alone. And the data analyst turned to me, and he, and he said uh, in broken English, you know, look, uh, uh, ice damage. And I, I go, no, Jim, no, 
It's not ice damage. Those are the holes which saved their lives. Because you remember, after they left the Endurance, they decided to try to cut for the peninsula, to the islands of the peninsula, and then they found they couldn't do it. So on the third day, they set out on their, on their big journey. Then after a couple of days, they realized they couldn't do it. They were towing their boats, and you know it just wasn't feasible. So they set up camp at a place they called Ocean Camp, which was only uh, one mile and a half, maybe two miles most to the northwest. And that day they set up camp. They went back to the wreck because they realized they did not have enough food. You know, they're eating every seal that came along. Every penguin that popped up, Wumpy went into the pot, you know, but it still wasn't enough. So they went back to the ship to see if they can scavenge any food, and they really couldn't. But then Hurley, the photographer, had this idea. You know, he said, well, you know, okay, so the deck is, you know, two to three foot underwater, but what if we cut a hole in the deck through to the cabins underneath? In, in particular to his cabin, um, which was called the Billabong. He was Australian. And uh, he, he knew that there was an awful lot of food stored in that cabin. And they did it. Chippy McNish, the old carpenter, cut these holes. And from those holes, they extracted three tons of food. And then straight away from being on very little rations, they went back on what they called full wax, full rations. And I'm confident that it was that which saved their lives. That food lasted them through to Elephant Island. So, yeah, it was incredible. Uh, apparently, I believe there's an... Yeah, there's one uh, question up the top. Up, up the top, we're in the middle. Where are we going? Hang on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yep. need somebody with a microphone, to, there's a question Hi. in the back. Um, oh. Sorry to burst the bubble slightly, but... Um, um, I'm just wondering, will all the technology and expertise for your expedition, roughly, could you give us an idea of how much it all cost and how you raise the funds to do it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm one of the trustees, and we're not allowed, I can't talk about the money because it's stuff which is gifted through the trust. And, you know, if you gave money to a trust, you wouldn't want your names out there. I'd love to be able to answer that because then it would be a way of saying thank you to those people, but I can't do it. Now, there's a question in the middle. Um, do you want to have another go? Me? Yes, yeah, your microphone. If it's working, yes, yeah. it is. Um, I wanted to ask about the artifacts that you mentioned, the Tron board. Yeah. And are they being taken off? Are they being studied? Yeah. Who, who owns them? Uh, Where will they end up? Yeah, OK, so a lot of questions there. We didn't touch anything. It was non-disturbance completely. Um, we, we did see artifacts there. Um, the, the ship is owned by the Shackleton family. We have no plans to go back. It is protected um, under the, um, uh, by, by the Antarctic uh, Treaty Conventions. It is a protected monument site right now. So no, we have no intentions to go back. But there were, yes, you're right indeed, wonderful artifacts there. I mentioned all the crockery. You know, we, we found, found one of Frank Wilde's boots. If you look at Hurley's photographs, there's a picture of Frank Wilde there feeding one of the dogs. Look at his boots, it's got a very distinctive buckle on it. We found one of those boots just laying there. Oh, one other artifact, and I'm going to go to the blonde lady on my right there in the Windward section, um, who happens to be my wife. <laughs> and I'm very nervous because she's waving like this. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, there's one other artifact I have to mention. Uh, Shackleton himself mentions a moment, they, he calls it his last official visit to the wreck before it sank, and they went on to the wreck and they found the ship's flare gun, which they put a percussion cap into the gun and fired it as a salute to the flag, which they'd raised on the mizzenmast, and then they left the ship. And guess what? We found the flare gun just laying there, exactly where Shackleton said he was, when they fired that gun. Wow. And that was, you know, pretty amazing stuff. Amazing. amazing. Yeah. Okay. Let's so, get a Menson's um, wife. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I just don't want you to all go until you hear probably one of my favorite uh, bits. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by every single element of it. A bit like you, I was hearing you, and it's been good that you know all the different um, angles. But what I would love you to do is to finish off by talking about the 100 years. Oh, thank you, Joe. Yeah, that is a goodie. Yeah, this, this is, um, 
Yeah, quite a story. Uh, we found the wreck on the 5th of March, 2022, exactly 100 years to the day that Shackleton was buried. And the story gets a little bit better than that even. It was about yeah, maybe the third day out, there was this little tap on my, on my door, very deferential little tap as I remember, and I opened up and it's my dear friend, Fred Bassimaeus from the south of France. And Fred said to me, Menson, do we know what time Shackleton was buried? And I looked in, in the reference material I had with me, which wasn't much, and I couldn't answer his question. So I contacted a friend of mine, a close friend called uh, Steve Scott Fawcett, who runs the Shackleton Appreciation Society page on, on the internet. And uh, I always go to, to, to Steve whenever I have a question I can't answer myself. Uh, and so I called him and I said, Steve, you know, can you help me here? What time did, did they bury Shackleton? And within an hour, he was back on the phone to me and he said, well, Benson, we know from the record, and he quoted me uh, the record from some people who have been actually there, uh, that they had the funeral at three o'clock in the afternoon in the Whalers Church, Great Vicken. Okay, so Steve starts to rationalize it all. He goes, well, you know, you never start a funeral on time, ever. You know, it's always five minutes late, like we were in starting this talk, right? <laughs> maybe even 10 minutes, you know, to let the stragglers get in. He goes, okay, the funeral, he said, would have taken half an hour, because in those days, they didn't go in for long funerals like they do now. And he said, then you've got to imagine that we've taken maybe another 15 minutes for them to process, you know, from the, from the church up to the grass, grassy knoll where they have the, the Whaler Cemetery at Great Vicken. And he said, well, there would have been a prayer at graveside, and then they would have interred him. Now, Steve didn't know about what time we found the wreck. Uh, he said to me, well, you know, they would have they would have buried him at about five minutes past four, maybe 10 minutes past four at the very latest. We found the wreck at five minutes past four. four. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm an archeologist, I'm pretty grounded, right? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an old cynic, but you know, even I was kind of thrown by this one. I mean, you know, it was kind of, make of it what you will, you know. But right. you, I mean, just the, the final kind of part of this and, and following on from that is that you and the team went oh, yeah. to, to the pilgrimage yeah. to the grave. After that, you know, we had, we had to go to the grave yeah. at, at South Georgia. We, we asked for special permission and uh, it was given. And so we went there and yes, we, we, had, a, we had a wonderful little service. Well, sort of ecumenical non-religious service, you might call it, at graveside. And, and I officiated and, and it was a wonderful moment. There was Captain Bengo who was standing, I was standing on one side of the, uh, of the gravestone and Captain Bengo was, was standing on the other and I invited him to say a few words. And I had no idea what he was going to say. And uh, he talked so inspirationally as he, he, he addressed Shackleton himself as, as one ship's captain to another. And you know, he said, boss, I've come to tell you that we found your baby. You know, at that moment, I'm like, whoa, you know. And it, was, it just got better after that. And then, uh, let's see, John spoke after that. John drew parallels between World War I and the fact that while we're down there, Russia invaded the Ukraine that just, you know, kicked the stuffing out of everybody on that ship. Um, and then I went to Dan Snow. And Dan was, uh, you know what, you, sh you should have had Dan giving this lecture, not me. He's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Oh, no he's way. the best communicator I know. And Another on top of all, he's funny, you know. Yeah. He's brilliant, Dan. He's a good friend. Uh, so I went to, to Dan and asked, Dan knew this was coming. You know, would, would he read Prosperous, Browning's poem, Prosperous, which was, uh, you know, Shackleton's favorite poem. And, and Dan's got this really deep resonating voice and everybody was in tears at that point. And then, oh, it's a bad mistake, I, I followed Dan, which is, you know, I should never have done that. You don't follow Dan if you give him a <laughs> And the point which I made was that, um, what occurred to me was that in all 
Shackleton's expeditions into danger that he himself led. The only life that he ever lost was his own, which I kind of thought was, wow, pretty heavy thought. So that was our, our service at grave, Graveside. Which is the perfect point to bring this to an end and say thank you so much for sharing your experiences and oh, with us. It was my pleasure, Joe. And then you were just great. Thank you for I've bringing us here. here together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Massive, massive thanks to Joe Cooper. There's little sweet spots, sweet spots you get during a festival where things just align. And to have the Natural History Museum here, and there's a few of the team over there, thank you. And to have Joe Cooper particularly looking after a load of Shackleton stuff just comes together so brilliantly. So just an amazing thing. So let me just tell you, the bookshop is, is clearly open. Uh, you are... You have to go and buy a copy, and then uh, Menson will be signing on the right-hand side in the foyer. So uh, thank you very well. Thanks again.